for our listeners, we're talking with Dr. Richard S. Harvey, who is one of the leading experts on this these topics we're talking and about. If you right? want to understand the uh, the truth of Scripture, you have to go back to the original languages. And now you've written a book to show the original Hebrew background of the Gospels. Right. What are you trying to demonstrate or prove here? The theology you get in the churches can be so flat and unmotivating. And when I started studying it in Hebrew, the truth just started kind of jumping off the page. I know that's not very academic sounding, but that's no, the way, that's it, that's the way it felt. So the next question, that's what started you off. Yeah. Where are you now and what are you trying to um, well, demonstrate? Uh, I never would have had the nerve to write the books that I wrote, except I was told to do so. Yeah. I was told to go and find the evidence of the Exodus and carry that message. Who told you? God told me. I, I prayed, and God responded. And he told me to do that. And so I did, and then he just handed me the inscriptions from the base of Mount Sinai and Midian. Hey, and Because I was whining and complaining that, you know, how could you possibly find this evidence? So you were trying to prove the historical uh, reliability of the Exodus accounts, and you came to discover what you believe to be the original Hebrew text of the Ten Commandments as an example of the first written alphabet. It was not the Ten Commandments, oh, okay. but the inscriptions were on the first ones were the footprints of the Israelites, their first literate act, really. They traced the, the, their footprints and put an alphabetic caption beside it, which was the Kaf, which came from a glyph that had three. So a inverted bowl with three marks there. So they put that against the instep of the foot. It means the, well, you know what a kaf means, but it means, it means the, uh, uh, it's the same in Egyptian. It means the palm of the hand, the instep of the foot. Of course, it's the name of the letter K, kaf now. That's in Strong's. Uh, uh, I w wish I'd just looked up in Strong's. It took me years to find that out, but, um, so it's not the Ten Commandments, it, but they are inscriptions and other inscriptions, basically funerary inscriptions that tell a story that comes straight from the pages of Exodus. So uh, one of them says, uh, uh, died um, Hagar, and then another one says, died Amaya Bat Hagar, which makes it Hebrew or proto hebrew and then the other one says, died Amalek. So they were all three found in the same place on the outskirts of the camp where the Amalekites had been raiding people, like unprotected women that weren't protected, didn't have menfolk, that were on the outskirts of the camp. So that, that tells a story that really comes straight from, from the, uh, the pages of Exodus. <coughs> Hagar itself is a name directly linked now, I'm not saying this was that Hagar, but as the matriarch of the region, the mother of uh, Midian, she would have, it would have been a well used, a name that was used a lot. So, uh, these, but th th that's not all there is to it, obviously. There's a whole world of context. This isn't anything like this, it's not a one off. You got to look at the whole context, not only of scripture, but of history. Does it fit? If it fits, it has merit. If it doesn't fit, you got to question. Yeah. Were, were, was the translation wrong? Were these fake? Or yeah. the, because they don't fit the rest of the evidence we have. You got to look at the context, and the context bore it out. Yeah. And now you've written a book to show the original Hebrew background of the Gospels. Right. What are you trying to demonstrate or prove here? Well, you said I started to uh, prove the Exodus. I didn't start to prove the Exodus. I started to find the evidence of the Exodus in order to see, number one, if there is any, and number two, does it reflect what's in Scripture? Uh, I was totally prepared to say that it did not. Um, um, you know, I'd been through the academy, and it was very liberalized, and, you know, so, so uh, I was totally prepared to say, well, you know, it's an old book. 
you know, people just got it wrong. But my discoveries led me to believe, and I found over a 10-year period of studying the evidence of the Exodus, I found an enormous amount of evidence of the Exodus where I'd started, all the experts were saying, there is no evidence of the, ex of the Exodus. And I found literally an overwhelming amount of it. It's being ignored because the meme is now, since Kathleen Kenyon and others, that uh, this is the point of the sphere, of the spear. The biblical, and they always, they will attack on the Exodus. They move, they taking two verses in from scripture and misinterpreting them because the, the timeline of scripture is very clear and very well established by serious researchers like Edwin Thiele. And anyway. So let me come on because I think this is going to be my podcast material as well as yours. Well, yeah, we what can do a little bit about the, the Hebrew roots of the Gospels. What are you trying to show there? Well, here's, a, here's another thing. Remember the evidence of the Exodus. I ended up saying, I believe it happened exactly the way it, the evidence shows that it happens exactly the way it says it is in Scripture. Now, on the, the, on the sons of Zion versus the sons of Greek, I find myself having to accept that things have been changed. Thank you very much. Things that the Greek church in, in translating into Greek and creating a Greek church, creating a Greek God, a Greek Jesus, Greek scripture, they at times played fast and loose with scripture and the meaning of scripture. Some of it was just mistakes, things that they had no use for in the Greek narrative, like the prophecy of the two messiahs, for example, had no use for that. And uh, the, tra the translation of Messiah in Greek tends to be the anointed one, not simply the anointed by God, of which there were certainly more than one in, in Hebraic history. So you get, <coughs> you get all kinds of, you get distortions of the word for the purpose of creating a Greek theological narrative, for example, right? Change the name of God, change the name of the sun, change the feast days to pagan holidays. And those are just a couple, those are just a few. There's a number yeah. of things. It sounds to me that you're taking a lot of shortcuts. You're, you're trying to make theological shortcuts by saying that when they translated or mistranslated <coughs> from the original Hebrew, to the original, to the Greek, that they imported a lot of different ideas. Now, I would say that it's not really just the translation from one language to another, but the whole complexity of the way that the early church of Israel and the nations together were working with the ideas of intertestamental Judaism, where there were multiplicity of different understandings of who is the Messiah, what will the Messiah be like, how will the Messiah be related to God himself. Mm -hmm. And I think um, what I hear from you, but I haven't read the book, is that this can be easily explained because when they translated the original Hebrew manuscripts into Greek, they made lots of changes. They did make changes. And some of them reflected their own biases. Uh, perhaps... You know, in trying to explain it in 25 words or less, it comes off superficial, which it's not. I've spent years researching this, yeah. so I know places there clearly are things that were done differently in the Greek Gospels from the Hebrew Gospels, and uh, that can be... And if you go back to the Old Testament, there is uh, a document called the Shem Tov Manuscript, which I'm sure you're aware of, of Hebrew Matthew. <coughs> and... Um, there were like 15 chapters and people really are mostly only interested in the one chapter where it translates the, the Matthew. Um, well, he, he recopies it from an extant, according to him, from an extant version that was still out there. There are other attestations that the Hebrew Gospels were still out there in Spain in the medieval period. So, uh, um, but in any case... The rest of the Shem Tov manuscript, which was a voluminous piece of work, 13 chapters were dedicated to the differences between the Hebrew scriptures and the Old Testament now, the Torah and the Tanakh, 
and the 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 Greek Septuagint, 13 chapters dedicated to changes that Shem Tov and presumably others thought they had made done wrong, gotten things wrong in the Greek Septuagint. Now I haven't <coughs> this is not I haven't researched all of those things yet because I'm working on the New Testament. Well, but this this is a long tradition. Yeah. Because the Septuagint and the other Greek versions of the Hebrew scriptures were not seen as authoritative, but they are held alongside the original... They're not the, seen the, as, the of, text. as authoritative by whom? Well, I'm talking about Jewish tradition. Right. So you're talking about Shem Tov's appendix. Of right. Well, it was, chapters. well, it's not appendix. It was the, yeah. really the main thrust of his work. Right. So I would say that this was already, you know, by the time of the Dies Tesserum, uh-huh. Common knowledge that, that yeah that there were differences yeah not in mainstream Christianity I don't think that was in fact the the mainstream Christian perspective on it is that the new t- the Old Testament and the New Testament were given to us in Greek by divine providence that's why they are inerrant so that's their their viewpoint is that the even the Old Testament is more authentic and inerrant than the Hebrew scriptures because God intervened to 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 make it so. Yeah, I mean, I think in the light of the, the patristic period, mm-hmm. yeah. they were working <coughs> with Greek. Um, but my point is, you know, what are you trying to demonstrate through this? Well, the title says the survival of the Hebrew Gospels and the Messianic Church. That's what I'm trying to demonstrate. But in the context, and the context is one of this continual battle, I suppose, between the sons of Zion and the sons of Greece, the most, um, the two most literate societies in the ancient world. And that they, that comes from the same source, from the alphabet at Sinai. So the first three chapters are really establishing the evidence of the Exodus and the proper timeline and how this came to be part of the Greeks, right? And how it affected them. You know, this gift of the alphabet, it's catalyzed their, their society too. And so since that time, these two societies, the most literate of ancient history, have been in, faced against each other in mortal combat, if you will, yeah. for cultural supremacy. Although, as I said, much of the time it was a love-hate relationship. There are periods when the interaction between the two was mutually beneficial to both of them to an enormous degree, and uh, other times when there was literally blood drawn between them yeah. often, and so a lot hear, of it. So I hear the basis of a theory... But to my mind, it's a biological, essentialist, dualistic theory. And uh, I'm biological, wearing, essentialist, what was the last word? Dualistic theory. Dualistic theory. In other words, it's a metaphor. Sons of Zion versus sons of Greece. Which is a, it is actually, you're not going to say it's not biblical, are you? Because that's taken from, from Zechariah. <laughs> I don't think it says Greece, does it? Yes, it does. What does it say? Really? Yes. It passes. It says, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a prophecy. It's Zechariah 3.9. Yeah, very old. Yeah. Uh, it says that the, the king will come, meaning yeah, yeah. once I have raised up the sons of Zion against the sons of Greece. So then that was a prophecy not only of the, of the Messiah to come, the Son of God to come, yeah. but also of the Maccabean War, where the sons of Zion did indeed rise up against the, the sons of Greece and, and trounce them uh, with the aid, according to Maccabees, of the archangels and the direct intervention of, of God himself. Zechariah 9.13. <coughs> 9.13, thank you. So this is where that prophecy comes from. Uh, but it even goes further back. I mean, it goes back to, to Genesis, where uh, it talks about... Um, Yavan, Greece? Maybe. Yeah, I'm raised... I filled the bow with Ephraim and raised up your sons of Zion over your sons of Yavan. Yeah. 
Well, I, I suppose I'm just reacting against biological metaphors as the basis for whole theoretical constructs about... Biological, biological metaphors. I would not call it a biological metaphor. It is not because they were of two different races, if you want to call it that. It was because they're both energized by the same thing, the alphabet that God handed down on Mount Sinai, which was adopted by the Greeks. In Genesis, it already talks about uh, that they will be given a promised land, right? That now belongs to, among others, the Cadmonites. Well, that's the tribe of Cadmos, who was living in, uh, their territory was around Tyre, and Cadmus of Tyre, he was called, and Sidon up there. And they were indeed pushed out during the conquest of the, of the uh, Promised Land and returned to Greece, where Cadmos founded the, the city of Thebes and brought with him the alphabet. The Semitic so really alphabet, the Hebrew a alphabet. There's a lot of assumptions behind what you're saying, built on a whole sort of raft or set of planks of an argument here. That's an assumption on your part. Is well, that... I haven't had the evidence. <laughs> there you go. I'm not a conviction, <laughs> so I'm making a preliminary judgment. Well, one of the things that I did in the, in the, the, the writing of God, which was my first book on that topic, Evidence Exists, I dug deeply into the linguistic evidence, mm. which, you know, these things happen. They did borrow, you know, the, the, the names of the alphabetic letters in Greek are Semitic names. Yeah. They, they took the Semitic alphabet. This is not really anything that's in doubt in yeah. mainstream linguistic theory. The order of the alphabet is the same. You know, the question is they call it the Semitic alphabet, so they won't have to call it the Hebrew alphabet. But it was... Well, no, I, I don't have a problem with Semitic languages. But I don't either, but I, the I fact think, is it was the yeah, Hebrew alphabet. I would have to do a proper reading of your book. And well, I one hope of you the do. problems in doing book reviews is that most people don't read the book, they just read the introduction and the conclusion. So this would probably be the fruit of a longer discussion when I've actually had time well, to read will, the book. We will, we will plan on doing that. I would be, I'd love that. And, but uh, I would too. Uh, so I find myself saying the opposite of what I said before. I said the evidence all points to it happening, the, the exodus happening exactly the way it says it is in Scripture. Now I find myself saying someone has been messing with the New Testament and the evidence is there. And uh, there, there's a, a lot of examples of it. it would, would you like one? My favorite? Go ahead. <laughs> this is my favorite. It doesn't mean it's the most profound. Okay. But uh, when, when Yeshua uh, returns from the dead and runs into the Marys on the, the road, he says to them, all hail. Now that is, a, that is a Roman military salute, but that's what they have in the Greek Gospels. Sometimes that's translated to good day, but you don't... Hebrew brothers in the faith do not address each other that way. All right? They are required, in fact, Ruth 2.4, you can look at it, they are required to bless each other with a greeting using the name of God. It was not prohibited in the first century. That prohibition came about in the second century, although the Greeks had tried to do it in the time of the Maccabean War, and they revolted for good reason. All right? So this, this uh, in the Hebrew Gospels, it says, may God deliver you. It says, may God is your salvation. And in the Shem Tov, it says the same thing. God is your de deliverance. So We're talking uh, about Matthew. We're talking about Matthew, the, the chapter 28. And verse... When he greets the Marys oh, okay. on the road. So a lot of times that's trans... Oh, verse 9. All right. Yeah, well, that is a Roman know. military salute, and if it... If it, if it looks like the Nazi salute, it's because Adolf Hitler did well, adopt says, it. Uh, Hang on. He adopted yeah. it as the official Nazi salute. So I can assure you that you should did not use the Nazi salute to, to, yeah. to well, greet I, his I followers on the road. All hail is a mistranslation of the it Greek. It is. Oh, the of the Greek. Greek. Is charite, Which means? Rejoice. Rejoice. And uh, the, I'm just looking at my... Delich Hebrew of verse 9. Uh, in the, uh, 
בישוע, נקרא עליכם ויאמר שלום לכם. Peace to you. <laughs> Which is probably, if we look at our Septuagint, the way that the Septuagint does translate shalom lachem. That's an assumption. Well, I, I haven't got my I, I haven't got my concordance of the Septuagint on my phone. But, but that's I'm, I'm simply it's doing very a much bit of background here. Much more in, in line with the Greek with is the... saying harate rejoice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. On what basis are you saying that this is a Nazi salute? I'm saying that it was translated as all hail. Who translated it? Who translated it as all hail? Yeah. I do not know. King James. That's mm-hmm. the King James version. Mm-hmm. So if we were to look at another translation, uh, which I don't have on my phone, I think you would read the words rejoice. We'd have to... I'm going to look at that and look at the various translations in which it was translated. Right, but the Greek is clearly karate, which is mm-hmm. the rejoice. And it's a typical New Testament and Hebrew greeting. It's much closer. It doesn't use the name of God, but it's much closer. To yeah, so I meaning. don't think that your favorite example has been persuasive for me. Well, this is what's really happening. You have to admit that it has been translated as all hail. I now, even though that, that's but even I'm though going that's to the a, Greek. Oh, okay. God. Okay, but even though that is a uh, incorrect, it's still a perception that is accepted. Well, yes, but you're, so you're, that you're perception was that, shaped by no, not by the translation from Hebrew into Greek, but by the way the Greek was then translated. Many of the greetings in, in Paul are karate and to Jesu Christo uh, kurios hemo, mm-hmm. rejoice in Yeshua the Messiah, our. Lord, and you can't persuade me that this is mistranslated by later Christian you just, tradition. You just agreed that it was mistranslated. No, no, I'm, I'm saying you cannot persuade me that this was, because what you're doing is you're connecting the relationship between the Hebrew and the Greek of the New Testament with later Christian tradition. Mm-hmm. Now, you asked me to talk about supersessionism. I can yes. do that as well. That's I'll good. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm at a disadvantage because I haven't studied all of the different variations of that verse. But I'm just pointing to the Greek. Oh, I gotcha. And the Greek is charete, which is rejoice. Yes, which is a fine translation as far as I can tell. But the, uh, the Hebrew Gospels actually use the name of God, which is the way they would agree. Let me, I only have the ESV on my phone. Let me see what that is. And behold, <coughs> Jesus met them and said, Greetings, which is not the imperative second person plural, karate, from kario, rejoice as a command, but it is greetings with an <coughs> exclamation mark, which is a more idiomatic translation. Yes. But greetings and can some not be confused with a Hitler salute. And some people say, Good day. Yeah, so. Yeah, you haven't persuaded me. In fact, you've made two jumps that I wouldn't accept. Mm-hmm. One is that the uh, if the original Hebrew was shalom lachem, which is peace to you, feminine plural second person pronoun, and you're saying that the Greek is changing that to charite, and then you're saying that charite is translated in English versions, as all hail. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm sure that the commentators have looked at the passage and said that there is good grounds for seeing this as a typical greeting that was common in Greco-Roman Palestine of the first century. And? And in fact, it's probably more typical of the language of the King James Version, where Ave is the Latin hail, mm-hmm. And you could say, Ave Kaiser, Moratori, Tesar, Lutamus, Hail Caesar, those who are about to die salute you, the gladiator. Mm-hmm. Or you could simply say, Ave Aque Vale, hail and be well. Well, you're taking it a long way from the origin. The, 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 in the Hebrew Gospels, it says, God is salvation. So, God is our salvation. So, uh, or may God be your salvation is probably the way it would be best translated, which is a much more typical 
Hebrew greeting to a brother in the face, then greetings are even rejoiced. The Hebrew greeting is Baruch Haba. Welcome. Baruch Haba B'Shem Adonai. That is a typical Hebrew reading. And I don't know what the other Hebrew reading is. That you're but so now me. you're taking it several steps on and you're, you're actually justifying all hell as being a reasonable translation of it. I say it's not a reasonable I, I, translation. No, I'm saying you're reading something into all hail, which is a, a sort of sinister, negative idea. Whereas if I go to my football crowd outside and say, all hail the victors. Mm -hmm. I'm not giving a Nazi salute. I'm just saying congratulations, you won the game. But it was the Roman military salute. All hail it is the Roman military salute. salute. And that, although this is innuendo, I will have to concede, it was indeed what Hitler right. adopted as the Nazi salute. Hitler may have adopted dog food for his dog. That doesn't mean that the dog food is inherently evil. True, but it is inherently offensive. Not only to people's sensibilities, I'm but to their understanding. The of the name of God is inherent. I, that's what I'm referring to. Yeah. Not only to their sensibilities, but also to their understanding of the yeah. text. But I don't think King James was using all hail to echo or to pre uh, sort of intimate a Nazi salute. Ooh. I suggest we postpone this debate I until I know all of the different versions and can track it. I'm not afraid to say I'm wrong, but uh, I think there is a pattern. Yeah. Can you want to give me another example? Uh, another example yeah. of it? Well, there are, let's take some of the typical ones. The word menorah is always translated candlesticks. Now, this is in the, in the Old Testament. This is an icon that was specifically, specifically designed by God himself in 10 verses, ending with make sure... You do it exactly the way I told you to do on, on Mount Sinai. So um, this is an, uh, an icon. Now, of course, it's the icon of Judaism. So the, the Greek church did not want this to become an icon of Christianity. So it's always translated as candlesticks, and it is to this I day. Think lampstand is more common than candles. Or, or lampstand, or the seven, or the seven lamps, or the seven candles. Yeah, so. But it's not translated as menorah. Well, obviously in the New Testament it is. And so when you have a, when you have a verse such as when Yeshua said, you do not light a candle to hide it under a bushel, but you put it on a menorah and hold it up to give light to all. The symbolism of that is pretty profound. So and when you, when you change it to candlestick, where, where it the wipes verse? out the symbolism. You do not light to... Which was the point? Yeah, can we have the verse? You do not light to... It's in Matthew, you do not light yeah. a candle Matthew to hide it under a seven? bushel. Yeah, candle under a bushel. But put it on a menorah, but on a menorah and hold it up and give light to all. Is this in your book? Um, yes. Bushel. So, what's the reference for that? Right. Lamp under the bushel. Okay, yeah. so Matthew 5 14. Uh, so, this is one of the things that is consistently mistranslated. It's not a candlestick. A menorah is a very specific thing, it's not any old kind of candelabra. So, that is always changed in order to avoid this, the Judaic symbolism of it. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but on a candlestick. So that's the King James version, mm -hmm. candlestick. So you're blaming it all on King James? Well, I, I'm saying that he didn't have electric lights in his day. So oh, it was worse than that. They changed the name of Jacob to James so just so his name would be in the Bible. Uh, ooh, not quite. Let's, let's, let's yes, I've heard. I've heard there's a. I've heard there's. Who dare use a luchnon kaitethese out on modion, modion. It's a good Greek word, which I don't really know. Luchnion. So luch is a, is a table and place it upon the under a bushel, but on the luchnion. So the luchnon is the light, and the luchnia is the thing that holds the light. Now, candlestick is not a good translation of that. It's said that it would have been the dynamic equivalent for 17th century uh, readers. Because mm -hmm. uh, it really means the thing that holds the luchnon, the light. Mm -hmm. 
It doesn't have to be a candle, it's probably an oil lamp anyway. So Luchnion is the Greek. Right. And I would say Luchnion is just neutral. And actually the word menorah is neutral. It just means a place where the oar is put. The menorah holds the oar. So the light holder holds the light. And even the way that we use the word menorah with a sort of religious symbolism yes. is, is us reading back into the text what is basically just a thing that holds light. So this is a lamp and the thing that's holding it is actually the menorah. Mm -hmm. In Hebrew, uh, was it verse 17? 15. Gamen madlichin, and we do not light a candle, u shama oto, and put it, tachat ha'ifa, under the bushel, ki im al ha menorah, the aim lechol anshe tavit, tavit. That's a very old translation. But it does say menorah.